Hi. Uh, it's both a curse and a blessing to be on the last panel. Um, so I, the, the blessing is that I feel like I know you all now, so I'm talking to friends, and the curse is that I was still nervous um, up to right now. So um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself a bit, and then I'll give my um, talk kind of from my position as an administrator, more as a researcher, but hopefully looking at the ways they intersect. So I come from um, the east coast of Canada, Nova Scotia, about five hours north of Halifax. So I'll show you on a map where it is. And I haven't been involved with the seed box um, except from watching from afar. I did my PhD with Estrita, so I heard about the activities and have been kind of on the sidelines. And when I saw that there was this conference, I thought it was a great opportunity to come and check it out for myself. And I, I haven't been disappointed. It's been delightful. Thank you for having me. I'm going to divide the talk up into three parts, um, looking at administering ethics, and I'll be talking about the, the animal research sphere. And I think it has neat dovetails with the talk Cecilia just gave. Um, I'll be looking at the animal care guidelines, so these are the regulatory mechanisms that oversee animal research, and then making a proposal on what indigenizing animal ethics um, from an administrative point of view rather than a research point of view might look like. So here's a map of um, Nova Scotia uh, on the east coast of Canada. You can see the tail end of Newfoundland at the very top. You can see Halifax there. And then that lovely looking island is uh, Unamagi, uh, the land of the fog, or also known as Cape Breton. There are five indigenous reservations uh, on the island, all Mi'kmaq. We're in Mi'kmaq there, which is Mi'kmaq territory. And Sydney is the, the only city up there, really 25,000 people. So it gives you a sense of, the, um, of the, the, the scope of the place. And Escazoni, uh, that's the middle reservation um, denoted with the uh, triangle. It's the largest reservation on the island with 5,000 uh, Mi'kmaq people and one of the highest language retention rates in the country. So it's a very active, very exciting um, place to live where there's a lot of uh, useful and productive synergies between the First Nations and the settler invader communities of which I'm a representative. And so the interesting thing about working at a small isolated university, and remember that's a five hour drive down to Halifax and nothing in between, um, is that um, it can be, uh, for many people it feels like a sort of end game in that we don't have graduate programs, graduate students, and it can feel very um, limited. But there's a lot of really interesting possibilities. And I want to look through what potential the small university has today through this intervention. And one of it is that um, as the Associate Dean of Research, as I am and have been for a few years now, I'm responsible for overseeing both the Research Ethics Board, which looks at regulating and um, and processing the ethics applications for doing work with humans, as well as the animal care operations. So I evaluate and uh, give counsel for the projects involving animal research. It's really rare to have the same person overseeing both of these. Um, at large schools, what we see is uh, increased specialization. Um, and what we see at small schools is that we have to wear all the hats. So I, I consider myself a, a generalist, a special generalist. Um, but it's given me the opportunity to compare two fields that I think are really rarely in conversation with each other. But there are lots of things we can learn about how to um, do what Cecilia is saying, which is to think uh, about compassion on a global or on a worldly level when we consider how we do research with animals in the same vein as how we do research with humans. It's, it's, a, it's an interconnection that doesn't get made a lot. And I know that because I attend the very administrative oriented conferences on animal care and they're never talking about human research. And I also go to the um, conferences uh, for the Canadian Association for Research Ethics Board's administrators thrilling, I know. And at those, we never talk about animal research. And it's because in most schools, it's not done by the same people. So they're not thinking about the parallels. But for me, the parallels are hard to escape. And I think so much of that comes from my training as an environmental, um, uh, environmental scholar. My own area of research is environmental literature. 
Um, and so I have that sort of thinking cap on and that critical animal studies um, knowledge as I'm looking at both. So when I got into this position, um, as a literary scholar, I really knew nothing about human ethics either. So I had to start reading um, on the regulatory mechanisms, the best practices, and just what the heck social science researchers do. Um, and uh, I've learned some great lessons about what I think has been uh, the best movement in that field in the last maybe 25 years. And that's been in the area of developing participatory um, and community-based research. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so in Canada, the guidelines for regulating human ethics or human research is the policy statement on the ethical conduct for research involving humans. Um, in Europe, there's, um, there's parallel, um, parallel policies, but they're at a, a, a bigger rather than just a national level. Um, and chapter nine of this policy statement it is, deals with research involving the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people of Canada. So within this document that we refer to um, as the Bible, colloquially, there's this chapter nine, which is a new initiative um, from maybe 15 years ago. And what it did is it, it established a baseline of what research with Indigenous peoples would look like in Canada. And um, that came out of, that didn't come from a top down, that came from the grassroots agitation by First Nations researchers and local governance bodies who really um, agitated for change in that area. Uh, so the First Nations principles of OCAP, ownership, control, access, and possession, really overhauled um, how research looked in Indigenous communities. Um, and of course, work like, um, like Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda Twice Smith, a Maori scholar, um, influenced the field in general, but then in Canada, we had these local manifestations of it. And so as I'm working, um, administering this research ethics board, um, we're drawing up new policy to make sure that people are showing that they have done community consultation and meaningful community engagement. We now have part of our, part of our application is, have you read chapter nine? Have you considered this and this from it? And then I was switching over to animal care and looking at the story of animal care. So in the human ethics side, we see a greater movement towards the democratization of research um, and this greater community connectiveness and responsibility to the people under study. In animal care, the scene just looks completely different. Um, in Canada, we're guided by the Canadian Council for Animal Care, and they're an arm's length organization operating at the national level. In Europe, you have a European um, council and set of guidelines. But both the Canadian, the European, um, and the US laws all revolve around this concept of the three R's. Uh, did anyone do a biology undergrad? It might be familiar to you. Um, the three R's of animal care or animal research are replacement, reduction, and refinement replacement, reduction, and refinement. Um, and what this means is that you have to show, this is the theoretical grounding for doing animal research. You have to show that you're doing the work um, because you can't replace the animal with something else, uh, either a model, and they do have like silicone models if, if students or researchers need to practice, say, um, injecting or, or giving oral fluids to an animal. You can use, for instance, silicon models. Or you have to show you can't replace the animals with a computer model. Or, um, always good idea in this realm, is to replace an animal with um, a cell or um, a partial body part, if you want to be gruesome about it. Um, reduction is the principle of reducing the number of animals that are harmed or um, killed, obviously, under study. But that one can be tricky because if you've reduced the animals to a number where your results are no longer significant, then you've literally wasted the few animals that you have done your testing on. Um, and of course, all this looks different whether you're doing behavioral research or say biomedical. And then refinement is the principle of always showing that you're refining the techniques of um, intervention or the instruments that you're using in order to 
um, towards the goal of reducing harm, stress, and um, and it's funny in that, I mean, we could talk more about those uh, finer points, but uh, the goal is not always to reduce death, but it is always to reduce suffering. So they, they develop within these frameworks really fine lines that are interesting to think through. Um, so we've got that theoretical framework for animal care, um, but then where I see it going is not towards the democratization and, and, and responsibility towards the animals, but towards greater and greater regulation and greater and greater prescriptiveness. So for instance, the guidelines on housing fish, not doing experiments on fish, but the facilities required to house the fish for experiments is 100 pages long and specifies everything down to the amount of space allowable between the door and the door jam, which is, if you're curious, three millimeters. So there's this intense prescriptiveness and high degrees of regulation into which care and animal disappears completely. And this has been well researched now um, by humanities and social science scholars who've been making some interventions into this field. So animal care is overly, overly bureaucratic and prescriptive and I think is moving in the wrong direction. Um, and it's, it's interesting to compare um, the trends in Europe to the trends in the US. In Europe, we see a greater move towards public accountability for research on animals and a push towards um, transparency. So even some, um, some experiments around allowing the public to view animal research, which um, in the US, they are not moving in that direction. And it, uh, animal research continues to be um, cloaked and um, segregated more from public view and thinking because in both contexts in the US and Europe we see a declining public support for animal research and so their responses have been different. In Europe it's been to say well look we're doing it to the best that we can we have these really important and very prescriptive regulations and this is what animal research looks like um, and there's some experiments um, out of research groups in the UK um, moving towards this. And in the States, it's to, to um, greater privatize it and segregate it. In the, in the States, there's, there are even some private research ethics boards that you can pay um, to have your ethics processed by. Uh, I find that just mind boggling. Um, and it's not a common practice, but they do exist. Um, so some critiques are that the guidelines um, are overly prescriptive. Um, my second critique is that there, the, the guidelines themselves, as well as the critiques of the guidelines, have tended to focus on this uh, intimate relationship between the animal care provider um, or the researcher and the animal itself. And when we look at the, um, you know, ever since Donna Haraway's 2008, um, when species meet, there's been a real surge of um, environmental humanities scholars and animal um, animal studies people looking at this relationship because it is one that's so infrequently in our view. Um, and Haraway's work really looked at that moment of interaction between the researcher and the animal. Although I would say more and more in most cases, it's not the researcher who is the greatest, uh, who has the greatest level of interaction with the animal. Not at all. It would be the lab tech or the animal care tech. And really the researcher might never, the PI might never lay their hands on an animal, especially at, at a large institution or with a large, um, large animal research project. Um, there are people whose job it is specifically to interact with the animals. And one of the reasons for this is a safeguard against the research interests of the, of the PI. So the, the PI has a specific interest in these animals demonstrating a certain outcome, whereas someone hired just to maintain the welfare of the animals is by, by that definition um, disinterested in the outcomes of the research. And so they should be the best person to care for the animal. Uh, another important scholar in the field is a, a Swedish scholar, Tora Holmberg, uh, from Uppsala, and she's done really interesting work on looking at mortal care, this concept of imagining 
how it is she's done research with the people who handle the animals and asking the question um, they do want to demonstrate and they are demonstrating a humanity through their uh, interaction with the animals how can they do that while still killing the animals which is often the required outcome of certain interventions so she's she's developed a concept of mortal care in order to explain that and for me it's a great level of personal interest because my father was an animal researcher and um, did did work with guinea pigs and um, and other animals while I was growing up so it's always been a sort of latent fascination for me which is so weird then that I find myself in this position um, so I think that this nexus between the researcher and the animal is important, but I also think that it doesn't speak to the community or the world in a way that I think we could be doing when we think about animals in the animal research um, sphere. And my experience at the small university is that research looks different here than a lot of the research that gets talked about um, in these critiques of animal care or in the animal care guidelines. All of this research in this field is focusing on um, <clears throat> lab studies in which there are sometimes hundreds of animals, at least dozens of animals, um, whereas the research that's happening at small institutions is often field-based. Um, it's often done with wildlife. Um, at our university we have fewer than 100 fish on site and most of the work that gets done is with fish or birds um, or wildlife anyhow. And so I think that we have to make the argument for if we want to do more responsible work with animals, we, it's useful to think about um, what species we're talking about, what context we're talking about, um, the situatedness of the instance of animal research. We can't just treat it all with one brush. So is there a model um, beyond the institutionalizing of care? How can we think differently about the work with animals and research, at least for field work? So coming back to CBU, um, my university, a lot of that research that we're doing um, is not only in the field, but it's towards public interest projects such as species restoration or ecosystem remediation. We've got a lot of um, old mining and um, old pulp mill tailings ponds where we're doing work on restoration of habitat. And a lot of this work that we're doing is in partnership with the Unamaki Institute of Natural Resources. So that's the um, Mi'kmaq governed natural resource body in town. <coughs> Likewise, a, a member of the Unamaki Institute of Natural Resources sits on our animal care board as our community representative. So we're deliberately trying as an institution to build in this reciprocal relationship with um, the local First Nations. And that's where I think that um, the, the next uh, realm, the next sort of, um, the, the next exciting move in animal care is going to lie. And I think there are parallels with where um, research with humans has gone. So, I've, I've brought up this quote from, um, from a group working with the National Inuit Commi Committee on Ethics and Research in order to underscore the fact that what I'm talking about, the indigenous uh, intervention into animal research, is something that's coming out of First Nations groups. And that if you talk to these local organizing bodies, whether they be um, uh, run by bands or autonomous governance bodies like in Northern Labrador um, or even friendship centers in the cities. Um, when they talk about partnering with researchers, uh, these local boards are already thinking about what that means for land and animal research as well. Uh, if you read here, uh, Inuit Nipingit wished to integrate the treatment of wildlife into guidelines for research involving humans, since many wildlife research practices are not congruent with Inuit cultural norms on how animals should be ethically treated. And this is what I'm hearing over and over. And I've, I've reached out to fellow administrators and got actually really great response from some folks at Trent, as well as at Lakehead and other smaller institutions across Canada who are saying, yeah, this is a topic of interest at our institution. And yes, we are being guided by um, the interests and protocols of local First Nations to do this. Um, but when 
it comes to brass tacks, as we say, uh, there's a gap in policy here. The will is here, but um, for instance, when the Mi'kmaq Ethics Watch, that's our local board, um, when they decided to add the word animal to the sort of jurisdiction that they cover, I had to call them up and be like, are you really ready for that? Um, have you considered what that means for the 100 fish on campus? Are they in your jurisdiction now that they're in Mi'kma'ki and being studied? Um, and the answer I got was that the next day, an uh, animal was removed from the guidelines. That wasn't my intention, but I think it, it underscores the fact that um, although the will is there, the, uh, the reality of what it will mean to bring animals under the guise of these local ethics protocols uh, is, is going to be a big hurdle, uh, but something I think we can work through. So I'm not the first to think of this. So I think that an intervention is needed, and I do think that the small university is a good place to see these experiments. And I thought this thing was timing me, but now I see I was looking at the wrong one, so I better um, be faster. Um, so uh, just an idea of what decolonizing animal um, research might look like. And again, this is just for a um, uh, wildlife context right now. Um, like in the human research sphere, we'd need to see authentic, what Julie Bull calls authentic community engagement, and this is not consultation. This is a this is a different thing where the community gets to define the research project and invite in the right researcher to do the work in the way defined by the community. We'd need to follow local protocols, and that might mean things like handling, um, killing, and disposal of animals in a culturally appropriate manner. For instance, um, there's a yearly um, moose cull in Cape Breton, and it's um, considered taboo not to distribute moose as meat once it's killed. So this might have interesting implications for the animal care realm where that's completely forbidden. Um, it would involve ca local capacity building rather than bringing in animal researchers and then bringing them back out of the community. Of course, provisions for data control, ownership, and possession of the data once it's gathered. And of course, uh, a dissemination that's not geared towards the scientific community primarily, but that's geared towards um, however the community itself um, wishes to see that um, written back to them. It, I think this move would have the potential to do good science and good service. The, uh, the relationships I've seen to date have always generated good science as their primary um, goal, so I think that would remain. It could bridge indigenous and Western science in practice and build reciprocal relations between the universities and communities, and um, even better still, build science capacity in community where we still have uh, uh, an over um, emphasis on the humanities and social sciences. So as an administrator, it's not for me to take this forward, but for me to bring it to communities and see if there is an appetite, and then maybe work with them and bring this to the Canadian Council um, for Animal Research and see if if that can be the next frontier for the work. Thank you. Thank you.